Okay, I think we will get started. I want to say good afternoon. My name is Judy Margles. I am the director at the Oregon Jewish Museum and Center for Holocaust Education. I want to welcome everyone to today's program with professors Omer Bartov and Stephen Wasserstrom to discuss the use and abuse of the Holocaust in American life. Our mission at the museum is to explore the legacy of the Jewish experience in Oregon, teach the universal lessons of the Holocaust, and provide opportunities for intercultural conversation. We challenge our visitors to resist indifference and discrimination and to envision a just and inclusive world. Our program today is offered in partnership with the Never Again Coalition and the Holocaust and Genocide Studies Pro Project at Portland State University. We're gonna put information in the chat so you can learn more about their programs. And all of our virtual programming, including this one and recordings of past programs are offered without charge. We're always grateful for any donation that you might be able to make to support our work, the work of the Never Again Coalition or the Holocaust and Genocide Studies Project at PSU. Our program today is the inaugural Herbert and Ella Ostroff program in commemoration of International Holocaust Remembrance Day, which takes place tomorrow. This day marks 77 years since the liberation of Auschwitz-Birkenau, and it's a time to remember the atrocities of the Second World War, honor our survivors, and challenge ourselves to use the lessons of their experience to inform our lives today. We are so very grateful for a request from Ella Ostroff that provided opportunities for this program. And there's really no better way to honor survivors everywhere than to know a little bit about Ella Ostroff. Ella was a Hungarian survivor who along with her mother, her two sisters and her brother were deported to Auschwitz in 1944. Ella's mother and brother were murdered in the gas chambers upon arrival Ella and her two sisters survived for nearly a year, shuffling between Auschwitz, Birkenau, and Dachau. After liberation by American soldiers in 1945, they lived in a displaced persons camp where they were reunited with their older sister. Two years later, the sisters immigrated to the United States. Ella met Herbert in 1948 in upstate New York, and they eventually settled in Portland where they raised their three children. Herbert died in 2003 and Ella in 2020. I am so grateful to their families that are listening in today, their daughter Sherry and son-in-law Stephen, grandchildren Ilana, Leah and Adam, daughter Hillary and son-in-law son Lars and their son Nick and daughter-in-law Jill. We're really glad you're with us. Ella and Herbert understood the importance of ongoing education about the Holocaust. I'm really glad that we have this beautiful photograph that the family shared with me that we can share with you. I think it vividly conveys what they had together, what they had together after overcoming such tragedy. So for today's inaugural program, we're going to examine the misinformation that has led to the politicization of Holocaust memory. I think we're all too familiar with it. Members of Congress, actors, talking heads on television, the corrosion of discourse is widespread and expanding. Just last Sunday, an anti-vax an anti rally in DC threw, threw thousands to the National Mall and more than one speaker made comparisons between the vaccine mandate and Nazi persecution of Jews. It's a vexing and unsettling scenario. And I'm just thankful that today, Omer Bartov, the John B. The John P. Birkeland Distinguished Professor of European History at Brown University will help us to understand why Holocaust memory is so susceptible to abuse and distortion. The discussion will be moderated by Steve Wasserstrom, Mo and Isetta Tonkin Professor of Judaic Studies and Humanities at Reed College. Our format today, as always, is going to be conversational. We're really interested in hearing from all of you. If you could put your questions in the Q&A tab and not the chat, that will make it easier for us to, to grab them. And we're going to endeavor to answer as many as possible. Thank you for being here. And Steve, I'm gonna hand the program over to you. Thank you, Judy. Um, I, I, and thank you for the invitation to do this today. It's obviously, an important, an important moment. 
Uh, let's get right to it. I wanna have as much time as possible to uh, hear from Professor Bartok. Um, so I'll, I'll open this way. Um, uh, it's been more than a year now that we first started to see the yellow star being used in anti-vaccine protests. Um, in fact, the Oregon Jewish Museum dealt with this on the state level at one point where folks started to show up at the state capitol. Uh, I, I've been informally tracking this phenomenon for, for, for months. And, and last night I pulled together hundreds of images. And the reason I'm, I'm, I'm starting this way is I, as much as I thought I had followed this phenomenon, I was really shocked by the number, hundreds and hundreds of images of all kinds of people in all kinds of countries. Uh, it's big in Canada, big in the UK, uh, in all kinds of places. So it's a particularly uh, vivid and efficient abuse. Um, and with that in mind, given the fact that we have, it's not likely to go away anytime soon, I'm wondering what, what, what you think of this phenomenon. Uh, first of all, thank you for having me. Uh, thank you for hosting this event and uh, to everyone who is listening to us. Um, it's, I, I think, I mean, you, you're right in the sense that, of course, it's become very widespread. Um, I, it's not the first time that we have seen this kind of uh, use of Holocaust imagery for all kinds of purposes. Um, and I would say that um, this kind of imagery, the, the yellow star in particular, uh, has been used by groups from all kinds of political directions. It is not uh, the, um, predominantly one or the other. It depends on the context, the time, uh, where you are. Why is that happening? Uh, I think to some extent, this is because the Holocaust has come to be seen as the most extreme case of inhumanity in the modern period. And so any reference to it is a reference that makes people sit up and respond to it. And it's very attractive uh, in a kind of perverse way to all those who want to make a strong point uh, of opposition, of assertion, of a political stance. Um, so in that sense, um, it's, uh, it's not as surprising as we would think. The only problem is that it itself, this use of this imagery plays particularly well into the very kind of rhetoric and demagogy that was at the heart of the Holocaust itself. So while those who are saying that they now feel as if they are like Anne Frank in the attic, as Mr. Kennedy said the other day, um, are actually using precisely this kind of imagery of victimization in order to present themselves as potential victims of tyranny, of oppression. And we have to understand that Nazism, fascism, always presented itself as a victim of other dark forces, of various conspiracies, of various people who were trying to undermine society, to undermine whatever they believed in. And so the use of this imagery is actually, even those who are saying that they are thereby protesting against so-called Nazi imagery are actually playing precisely into the same kind of rhetoric. And that is what is so disturbing and what is so frightening in that. Uh, if we could think that at least the use of this imagery shows an opposition to fascism, opposition to oppression, opposition to tyranny, that we might not agree with one point or another, but we could at least sit back and say, we have taught people something. But in fact, it's the exact opposite. I, I will give you just one example that occurred to me when you mentioned that, uh, you know, I come from Israel um, and I, I go there a lot and I grew up there. Uh, when the Gaza Strip, when the Israeli settlements in the Gaza Strip were evacuated by the Israeli army, the settlers there 
protested by putting yellow stars on their clothes and calling IDF soldiers SS or, or, or German or Nazi guards. Uh, now, this was a government decision. This was something that had to do with the only Jewish army in the world. And they, these settlers presented themselves as victims of fascism. And so the use of this image can be, can entirely distort a political discourse rather than helping us understand the world we live in. Thank you, I'll, I'll follow this up and then we can, we can start to open up the, some, some of the questions. So what, do, what can we do about this? Uh, I know you don't have a, there's, there's no, no one answer to, but it's such a diffuse problem. Uh, let me ask it this way. Uh, as educators, we're used to, for example, de dealing with Holocaust denial, an another form um, of insidious abuse bought through education and other, we never debate them, but, but, but there's means by which we now have um, books and resources and all, all, lots of resources for dealing with that to the extent that we can. This is a little different. This is more like a walking meme. Uh, and, and so it moves almost virally. Um, do you have any thoughts about what, what can be, if we call attention to it, I'm afraid that it, 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 it only helps them. Uh, well, you know, I mean, I, I, it's, I, I don't have a, an easy answer to this. Of course not, uh, I wish I did, but I would say there, there are two elements, I think. One is often much of this rhetoric is based on ignorance. So people use the image, Nazism, camps, concentration camps, uh, genocide, but they don't actually know what occurred. Um, they use it only as a, as a symbol of what should be opposed. So the first thing that uh, would be helpful is education. And we as educators, um, I think have not always done a terribly good job in teaching uh, history, uh, and even the history of the Holocaust. And we have to remember that the Holocaust was not really a major issue for anyone anywhere, apart from the survivors and some of their families, well into the 1980s. It's only then that we start talking about it. And now that the Holocaust is being taught, it is often not taught as so much as an historical event, but often it is taught as a kind of focus of identity for different groups. If we actually studied the history of the event, it would tell us certain things about how this kind of hatred um, comes into being and how it can be mobilized then by political regimes, by ideologies. And so I think education is very important and it's education in schools, in colleges, but it's also in the media. Uh, this, is, this is one thing that is very important. The, the, the other I think is that we are facing a, a conundrum right now, uh, which I think uh, we all have to somehow understand that on the one hand, we do see a rise in anti-Semitism and much of what you describe can easily be also seen as anti-Semitism. We do see a rise in anti-Semitism uh, around the world, uh, in the United States, in Europe, Eastern Europe, Western Europe, um, in parts of the Middle East. So there is a whole lot of anti-Jewish rhetoric. Uh, and this kind of political rhetoric works on that, it um, triggers it, it feeds on it. At the same time, there is another uh, political aspect to it, which is that the, the, the Holocaust has come to be used by particular political actors as a cover for um, explaining or trying to explain away polit um, politics of oppression. And that is particularly in the case of the state of Israel. So there is, and, and you know, I, I, as I said, I grew up there and I'm, I'm, I, I spend a lot of time in Israel. I've been writing on this. Um, there is, uh, there's been a concerted attempt by Israeli political regimes, particularly since the Netanyahu regime or administration, uh, 
to argue that any criticism of policies by that state is anti-Semitism. So that meaning it can lead to another Holocaust. And so that in a sense is two uses of the term that collide with each other. And it's often very hard for us to disentangle them and to work against one without falling into the rhetoric of the other. And I think this is something that we as educators, people who are in the media, have to find a way to talk about without justifying injustice. That's a uh, fascinating and provocative uh, example. Um, I, uh, you and I are, I think, probably roughly contemporaries, and we we've been so we've been doing this for a long time, and it is concerning on uh, see how I can frame this question, how quickly things have changed and broadly speaking, how much worse they've become when it comes to international anti-Semitism, um, the as, as, as diffuse, diffused as the protocols that Elder Zion were, all the more so today and on, it went, one unfortunately uh, can go on. Um, I just, I, I'm wondering what we are doing wrong with education, I guess, where we are doing a lot of educating, we're producing a lot of wonderful books and certainly uh, yours among them. We have this wonderful museum and yet the problem gets worse. I, I, I'm not quite sure this is a question or d despair, but it is an unusual kind of almost inflection point now or where there's, it feels like it could get much worse. And that, that used to feel like just alarmism to have that feeling, but it seems somehow different now. Well, look, I mean, I, I don't think that, that education alone uh, is sufficient. Uh, what we have seen in the last few years, I'd say it's, it's, it's been a decade and it's, yes, there's an, an, an acceleration in a particular process and one has to diagnose what that is. Uh, what is bringing about these kind of um, it, um, increasingly radical, extreme rhetoric, uh, hate, uh, populism, xenophobia, fear. And I think that, you know, we are educators, we can talk about education, but there is a larger context. And the larger context is that, to my understanding, and that's what you point at, this shift from, we were going in one direction, uh, we thought there's more, um, uh, we are getting farther and farther away from populism, more and more democracies, the communist system fell apart, you know, history came to an end, everything looked good. And from that point on, things have started going the other way. So what is it? And I think that in large part, we are talking about uh, much deeper reasons for that. There has been a growing disenchantment with democracy. There's been a growing disenchantment with democratic regimes that are seen more and more to be more and more corrupt. There has been a deep sense in, I think, in the United States, in many European countries of a growing economic gap, of a lack of opportunities. If you add to that also policies of immigration that have made people feel that, so to speak, the country is being taken away from them, that people who are coming from other parts of the world, of other religions, wearing different kinds of dresses, having different kinds of ethnic traditions, coming into their small towns, and they feel threatened by that, that has uh, opened the way to this kind of new polity, uh, policy or policies that have some resonance with what occurred in the late uh, 19th and early 20th century. That is, what I would call a politics of resentment. That there is more and more resentment in larger and larger parts of the population in democratic countries. If you add to that the fact that, as I mentioned, the Soviet, the communist system fell apart. And I think no one regrets that. But we live now in a world that has only one kind of system. And people don't, people who are unhappy with that system because they themselves have not received what was promised to them. The, all the nice liberal rhetoric has not actually worked in their own case. And there are millions of those people, they're looking for something else. And what they look for now when they're fearful, when they feel resentful, is somebody who comes along and says, A, I know who's guilty. 
these people are guilty, it's the foreigners, or it's the Jews, or it's the blacks, or it's the whoever it might be, and then says, I can take care of it. Put me in power and I'll take care of it. That is extremely um, tempting, uh, attractive to people who feel fearful and confused. And this is not something that we as educators can resolve, obviously not, but it is at the core of, I think, the kind of erosion of democracy, of liberalism, of um, um, uh, humanism uh, that we are now seeing. And I do believe that it will get worse. Uh, unfortunately, I tend to agree with you. Um, I, on that note, I think I'm gonna pivot to the questions that are starting to pour in. Um, you've already sim stimulated many of them, so I'm, I will um, direct them to you. Um, is there a, a connection between misappropriation of Holocaust imagery and Holocaust denial? It's a good question. Uh, yes, um, because Holocaust denial can be, I guess, two things. Uh, one is the obvious kind of denial, and that is that you say it just didn't happen or there, there were millions of Jews, maybe a few thousand, but uh, uh, a lot of people die anyway. So, so there, there, there can be that kind of Holocaust denial, but there can be another uh, Holocaust denial, which is actually the use of the, the appropriation of that imagery of, and, and that rhetoric and application of it to something else, say to anti-vax. Uh, so in that sense, that is not denying the event itself, but it's using a completely distorted understanding of it for your own political needs. Uh, thank you. Uh, do you have any thoughts on, the, on education in the workplace? Are there best practices in discussing the topic outside of higher education in a professional setting? Interesting. That's also a very interesting question. I mean, you know, there, there, there is a history to this. I mean, there used to be a notion, certainly under socialism, of uh, educating people not only in schools, but in their workplaces. Uh, that is, does not exist, certainly not in the United States, as far as I know. Uh, but I think when we talk about education, we have to talk about education on uh, not only what you teach, but how you teach. Uh, we have to talk about uh, an equality of education. You know, I teach at Brown University. It's, it's a pretty good place, right? So we get very good undergraduates. They're supposed to be the creme de la creme of, and they know very little. They know very little because they still come from an educational system that just teaches them very little. They, and one thing they know very little about is history. And if you don't know history, you don't know where you are and where you came from. So you can't know where you're heading to because you have no perspective. And that is not being taught well anywhere, whether it is in elite schools or in public schools, uh, quite apart from the fact that the education generally now has become you know, divided between different levels of schools in none of them is history taught very well. So from my point of view, whether you are in elementary school or in high school, I'm not talking about college, uh, the, the very, or, or even just in the media, if there were more discussions of history as history, simply knowing the past, studying the past, understanding how we came to be here, rather than only using it for political rhetoric, that would help. I don't think it would solve the question, but I think it would help. The education can, does continue to grow, as you know, uh, in, on, at different levels uh, throughout the country, different states. Um, I'll just express a, a particularly uh, a acute concern, and that is what's happening in Florida and in Texas, and most recently in Virginia, where there's this, this populism, uh, that is pointing in the direction of parent-directed um, control of education. Uh, and that, uh, at the moment, and that hasn't yet 
taken the a fairly, it seems to me a fairly obvious move, which is say if, and I know it's brought up by fascists in various locales, that if you're gonna teach, if you're gonna mandate, and in fact, the, uh, uh, the museum here can talk about the way they worked with mandates in the state here. It's, it's just a story, interesting story in itself. But if you mandate education on the elementary level, then some folks we can imagine are going to come in and say, there's another side. Uh, and then we have a real problem because then they're, they're going to le leverage it to do, I don't know, Holocaust denial in the schools. Yeah, you know, this is this is a, a, a particularly American issue, I would say, but and it has to do with the general sort of American suspicion, which is often healthy suspicion of the state, of the authorities, of who is going to tell me what to do. And myself, you know, having been trained as a German historian, you know, and in Germany, there was this cult of the state, the state was a being, right? The, the, the state tells you to do one thing or another. So there's something healthy about this on one level. It's, it's, it's good that people don't take anything, everything that is told to them by the superiors, by ministers, by administrators as, you know, the word of God. But at the same time, you know, if as we had a governor who said that he's not going to let uh, parents um, tell teachers what to teach, and so he's no longer governor. Um, the idea that um, you cannot have some concept of what you believe has to be taught, that there are things that people have to know, have to learn, that that's up for a vote, that any parent can say, well, I don't like them reading that, or I don't like them studying that, uh, that can be, of course, used by all kinds of elements to persuade these parents that their children are being brainwashed, that their children are being taken to places where their parents don't want them to go to. I, I'd say there's another element, and this is not right or left, of course. We have now discourse on both ends, for instance, on books. Which books can you teach and which can you not? And this is happening on both sides. You have now on the on the American conservative right people saying they, they don't want to have books that they paint a, a critical picture of the United States of, of American history. Uh, they want the good history, not the bad history, which, by the way, reminds me of some um, German rhetoric in the 1960s and 70s, which was about why do we have to teach only the bad history of Germany? Let's teach a good history. Uh, let's bypass the Nazi period. Uh, so you have that on the right, but you have it on the left too. You have books that have been taken out of circulation because they use words that shouldn't be used anymore. And so you can't teach certain authors or certain works because the people feel uh, harmed by them. And, and so what you're left with, you only want to teach those things that you feel comfortable with. And that is not a way to educate anyone. If you are dealing only with what is comforting to you, you will never study anything. You will never develop any critical faculties. Uh, and that's something that this society, I think, has to have a conversation on. Thank you. Uh, this is coming from another one of our fellow educators. Uh, in regard to education, I think we need to model when and why comparison and connections to the Holocaust are appropriate. What are some examples of appropriate connections and comparisons to the Holocaust? Yeah, you know, people would usually tell you, don't compare anything to Hitler. Uh, don't, don't bring it into a conversation because once you do, you are, you are bringing an elephant to the room and, the, and, and you cannot discuss anything anymore. And in part, I think it's true, but uh, we all uh, have done it before. Uh, I think we can't avoid it. Um, so what are comparisons that you can make? What you can certainly talk about, uh, whether it's in the case of the Holocaust or actually in the case of many other genocides in the 20th century, you can say, what can you identify as a particular um, origins or particular roots of what may later on become a genocidal ideology or genocidal policies. That you can identify. Uh, you can talk about the fact that if you identify a particular group in your society 
or on the borders of your society, and you start talking about those groups as not being fully human. You start applying all kinds of names to them as cockroaches, as was done in Rwanda, or as ungeziefer, as vermin, as was done with the Jews, or untermenschen, or subhumans, as was done with the Slavs, or, or thieves and rapists, as was done by the past, uh, our former president regarding uh, people coming over the Mexican border. Once you start using this kind of rhetoric about groups within your own society, it doesn't mean that there's going to be genocide, of course, but you are already targeting a particular group and giving people an idea that they don't belong to your sort of notion of a solidarity of human beings. So I think that there are certainly examples that you can learn without at the same time saying about any political leader you dislike that they're Nazis or that they're fascists or that they're Bolsheviks. Thank you. Um, moving on um, away from the collective to the individual, um, we have the, the following question. What are some specific things that we as individuals can do today to help change the current trend of increased anti-Semitism? It's not, I suppose, directly on our topic today, but if you, uh, if you want to try and tackle it. You know, I can try. I mean, I think, um, the, the first thing we need to do is to talk about it uh, and to identify it. And, and it, it is true, you know, I've, I've, uh, I came to the United States in 1989. And uh, at the time, for, for a long time thereafter, any uh, public figure that used any anti-Semitic imagery in public uh, would be taken to task. Uh, right away. There was an immediate sort of response to that. And that has changed quite a bit in uh, recent years. Um, so I think one thing that we need to do as individuals is to identify that and not to be shy of doing that. Now, you may often be identified, and that's a term that's often used in these contexts, as paranoid. Uh, you, you will be told, no, 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 that's not really it. And maybe it isn't. But if you think that you are identifying some kind of anti-Semitic talk, you should identify, you should speak out. You know, in, in the, in, here I'll make an analogy. In the, in the late 19th century, uh, in German speaking countries, there was a term, a term that was used for anti-Semitism that it became in German salonfähig. That is, you could speak about it comfortably in your sitting room. You didn't go and beat up Jews, but you could use these sort of expressions comfortably in your own space, in society. That is something that should not be allowed. It should not be allowed uh, regarding Jews. It should not be allowed regarding any other group. And if people talk that way, I think in any group that you're in, you should out them. Uh so this following up precisely on, on that observation, people sometimes say things like the fashion Nazis, et cetera. What is a good response if someone, presumably in the, in the, uh, in the social world or in a, in a professional setting, if someone connects Nazi with something like fashion, which is of course a ridiculous comparison, and I won't, it, what, do you, what you should respond as you just said, so what sorts of things can, it's, uh, it's a complex, uh, you, the educational route is a little complex in the, in the, in the workplace. Well, first of all, it's, it's, it's an old thing, right? I mean, the Nazis were actually very good in sort of selling their image and they did it across the, 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 the destruction of the Third Reich. Uh, you, you can even watch Hollywood movies from the 1950s and there's always some very elegant SS man uh, he may be very vicious and criminal, but he's dressed immaculately and he's very handsome. And, and so there has been this kind of attraction in, in all kinds of spheres, you know, in sadomasochism, in, all, in, in films from the 1970s, Italian films from the 1970s had all this kind of imagery. So it is there, it has always been there. Um, one should, I think, do the same thing. I mean, I, I have seen that and uh, this is there is nothing fashionable uh, about acting like someone who uh, identifies with not just mass murder but also with 
dehumanization with the idea that some people are superior. And in some ways you're putting on these clothes, these mannerisms, these symbols make you appear as if you're superior to others. Uh, it's, it can be very hard to do that in the workplace. I, I recognize that and um, I am in a slightly more you know, comfortable environment than that. Uh, but I've had encounters, uh, I must say, also in academe with people who spouted anti-Semitic opinions and I told them that. And after that, I refused to have anything to do with them completely. And I cut off any relations with them. Uh, and I think if you can do it, you should. Dr. Koch. Um, so uh, um, this is a very concrete question. Um, and so it, this might not be relevant to all our uh, participants, but it's, it's very concrete. So I'll, I'll pose it to you. Uh, assuming they're familiar with this, how does D Dara Horn fit in with the failure of education to deal with rising anti-Semitism? Are you familiar with the reference? No. Okay, let's 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 move on then. Um, uh, we have a question about the use and abuse of social media without any kind of accountability of what they put out and with whom. That's a big one. Well, that's that's huge, and uh, you know, a lot of people uh, have been saying that much of what we see now uh, and the kind of disintegration of conventional politics is um, not just the use of social media as such, but the fact that uh, there is no reliable source of news. Uh, the people can get their news, meaning they know about the world. They know about what's happening around them from all kinds of sources, including what happened in the past. Uh, and they get it from um, um, all kinds of elements in social media that nobody can control. Uh, so what do you do about that? You know, the, the, there are ways of dealing with that. One is what uh, China does, right? You just control it. Uh, so you control the social media by using your own uh, totalitarian methods uh, of uh, observing everyone and everyone's social media. And so every time you put something on social media, you know that the Chinese police is following you. That's not something I would recommend for a democratic country. But it's not that it's impossible uh, to control social media. It is possible. It's just it comes at a price. Um, the, the only other way I think to deal with this is in some ways to remember, and again, I'm making an analogy, that all these sort of lies that are floating around and distortions and theories and conspiracies that are floating around social media uh, existed before there was social media. Social media did not invent them. Uh, this has always been part of society of, of, of human beings and the best way to uh, work against it without shutting it down with a hammer uh, is to provide other venues of knowledge and information that people can actually believe, that people can actually trust. And it's, it, it's important to understand that the, the, the conventional, the reasonable, uh, media of news in, in this country have not been so great at providing that. They have spent so much time on other garbage, right? On health and sports and, and, and food and dieting. And, 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 and they, there is not much that you can get out of them if you actually want some real understanding of the world you live in and where that world came from. And if we could create a more reliable set of media outlets that would do that, that would be attractive enough, but also reliable, then that would, I think, in some ways work against this kind of constant production of news garbage. Uh, that's an interesting point. Um, when someone says to me, I have a good, Jewish friend, I feel already that is a degrading statement about Jews. How do you respond to that? 
Well, it can be all kinds of things, you know. I mean, that's the the the, the usual anti-Semitic line was uh, some of my best friends are Jews. Uh, so, and and that is supposed to give you license then to say all kinds of degrading things about Jews, uh, but it can be completely innocent as well. Um, so it's a little um, hard to tell. I think you need to know the context. Um, it's one thing that is clear to me currently in the United States that is sort of interesting to me as an historian, but troubling as a citizen, is that there's more and more identification of people as Jews who before that were not identified as Jews. And we have to remember that historically Jews have become sort of white only in the last few decades. Uh, you know, Jews were easily identified as Jews uh, well into the 1950s. It's only the 1960s that Jews start sort of moving into the mainstream and disappearing in a sense as Jews and becoming just white men and women. Um, th that was always the fear of anti-Semites. Anti-Semitism as a modern phenomenon is a result of the emancipation of the Jews. That is when Jews cease being identifiable they became emancipated, they, they dropped their religious garb and they started dressing like everybody else and living like everybody else. And then there was a fear, how do we know if they are, if behind that normal facade lurks that traditional Jew from Eastern Europe. So it's, it's something that is part of a particular, I'd say, um, um, problematic of, Jewish relationship to the rest of society, that the more you blend into society, the more some people become fearful that somewhere lurks something different that can no longer be identified. Um, and I think that's a condition that it, it, you can't entirely resolve. It's part of the issue. Uh, uh, if I could follow up on that, uh, that uh, as you know, the, the Nazi jurist Karl Schmidt said, the real enemy is the assimilated Jew. And, and Goebbels and others gr uh, ground up propaganda about mimicry and about Jews pretend that this, Jews are invisible, they're everywhere. Uh, and, and in a way, I think you're right, that was an ironic function of success of beginning to lose a distinctive ethnic identity and, and living at, in, in society at large. Um, I don't know if, I, if that's a, a question or observation. It seems to me somehow important. Uh, folks, among other things, uh, don't really know what they're looking at today. The world has moved very quickly. And so they, if they're concerned about this, they, they can't necessarily know whether somebody is a Jew or if that, that's a, a problem or a danger or this, uh... Well, I'll, 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 I'll add one, one thing to that. I mean, I think this is all true and that's part of, you know, I've been writing on this and I'm, I'm, I'm quite interested in that. But yes, yeah, so, so part of it is this thing that assimilation, emancipation, uh, and in the American case, it's also Jews were part of the, of the civil rights movement uh, and then they moved into the suburbs. Um, and, and, and so they became white, they became American and they started also taking in uh, to, um, uh, larger or smaller degree, some of the prejudices of white American society vis-a-vis -vis, uh, other parts of American society. So I think that's one part, but the, the, there is something else which is, and it takes me back to an earlier point that I made, that uh, because of the existence of the state of Israel, there, there are two, also two contradictory elements to that. One is that I think many Jews in the world, whatever they think about Zionism and the state of Israel, are sort of comfortable that there is a Jewish state and there is this notion that if you need to, you could go there, right? So if you keep a little bag under your, your bed and you think, if, you know, anti-Semitism suddenly arrived, the pogroms, I can always go there. But at the same time, there is a growing identification as part of this uh, anti-Jewish rhetoric, growing identification of Jews with what the state of Israel is doing. Uh, and you see that a lot. I mean, in France, there's a whole lot of that. Uh, and so that the, the existence of the state of Israel and policies that it conducts that many people disagree with, then is a reason to target Jews who have got nothing to do with it. Uh, and it gives you an excuse to uh, present yourself as a protector 
of human rights, as a protector of, of the, the downtrodden, of the oppressed, and then you can oppress others, those who live in your own neighborhood. And, and that's a kind of uh, another conundrum that we live in uh, at the moment. Indeed, a real, a real challenge, I think. Uh, has anti-Semitism been appropriated, conflating hatred of Jews with disapproval of the Israeli government? This is a follow-up question uh, to your, your, those comments. Um, has anti-Semitism been appropriated, conflating hatred of Jews with disapproval of the Israeli government? I guess you just spoke to that point. So yes, uh, yes, absolutely. Um, yes, I mean, I, I, I think it, it has, but I'm, I'll just add one other thing because there, there, there have been discussions in the United States and even more so in Europe uh, about anti-Semitism, xenophobia and racism. And I think in many um, sort of liberal discourses, there is a tendency to say, well, it's all really the same thing, right? I mean, you don't like particular people, you don't like foreigners, you don't like people of a different race, and you don't like Jews. Uh, and on, on one level, it's true, but on another level, it's actually obfuscating issues um, because they come from different places. Anti-Semitism has its own history, and that history is, is not the same as the history of anti-Black sentiment or the history of anti-foreigner sentiment or, or anti-immigration sentiment. They can overlap at times, they can look alike, but they also have very different roots. Um, and I think it, we, we actually need to distinguish between them. Uh, they don't always rise at the same time. And at times people who are themselves oppressed or people who are themselves persecuted can turn against another group. So you can have, uh, say, in France, you can have um, um, a large Muslim population that often feels, and quite rightly, that it is um, um, uh, not accepted entirely in French society. And yet within that group, there's a great and growing uh, element of anti-Jewish sentiment. And that anti-Jewish sentiment is in part driven by um, identification of Jews with Israel and in part driven by identification of Jews with wealth within uh, French society itself. So uh, we have to distinguish between them uh, and not to put everything together in the same basket and say, well, we're all against all of it. Uh, I'll just observe that uh, the one of the other functions uh, um, of the social process that we're dealing with is globalization, internationalization, and that these are no longer, we, it, it's difficult to deal with these problems in part because they're no longer local. Uh, so a, 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 a tragic example would be, at least according to the press, the shooter in Colleyville, Texas, who came, who came from Europe, I guess, and got, somehow got a gun here and, and thought that he that the, since the Jews controlled the world, if he went to a synagogue, that he would that he would be dealing with uh, other other issues that he had. Um, that's particularly not now. It's maybe always been international in a way, but this is uh, it, it's a this sort of erosion or evaporation of locality is particularly uh, troublesome when it comes to trying to figure out where the targets of our education are. Yeah, and you know this uh, um, this irony of um, 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 sort of thinking that the Jews are overpowerful, uh, and therefore maybe we need to work with them uh, somehow goes way back. So the Balfour Declaration, you know, which was issued by the British government in World War One, and was the basis of ultimately the creation of the State of Israel. Uh, was in large part uh, driven by the idea that Britain wanted the United States to enter into World War I and to fight against Germany because Britain didn't have enough uh, men and, 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 and material to do so. Uh, but how to persuade America to join the war? Well, America is controlled by the Jews. And if we tell the Jews that we're gonna give them a state, uh, then they will pressure their government to help us uh, fight the Germans. And the people who were in this decision-making process in Britain at the time were the top politicians. And they're not anti-Semitic in any, you know, 
obvious way, apart from thinking that there was Jewish power that could be used to their own good. Uh, so this exists, uh, has existed for a very long time. Well, yeah, and we're not going to solve it today, alas. Uh, suppose that an anti, this is to go back to the way we started, uh, suppose that an anti-vaxxer says something like this, and, and I quote, I believe that a government mandate to get vaccinated is an overstepping of government authority. It can be a slippery slope to fascism. Um, do you have any suggestions on how you respond to something like that? Well, um, you know, um, every government has uh, a responsibility of public health. Uh, and when you elect uh, people to office, uh, one thing you expect from them to do is to make sure that the, the, there are uh, guidelines uh, in place for public health. When you send your children to school, uh, they have to be vaccinated in all kinds of uh, ways. And if you don't vaccinate them, they can't get into the classroom. Uh, and this is just one more vaccine. So it's got nothing to do with any of that. Um, and and it, it's got nothing to do with fascism. It's got nothing to do uh, with any of that. It has to do with public health and people who do not uh, abide by policies of public health uh, people who may say, well, I can do what I like with my body, but they're not, it's not their body, they're carrying a virus and infecting their environment. And so they, are, they should actually be shown to be a danger to the public. Uh, we're moving towards uh, uh, some of our conclusions. I have a, a couple final questions that have come in. Um, can you talk about um, what you see going on in Europe? Parallels, different kind of abuse, uh, and are there appropriate comparisons? Yeah, I mean, everyone in Europe, certainly, people have uh, long memories and they remember um, the war, they remember Nazism, they remember occupation, they remember Soviet communist rule, uh, but they respond to all of this in all kinds of ways. Um, so first of all, people are making analogies in Europe. It's not me who is needed to make these analogies. People are thinking about it all the time. Um, I think that in America, we should remember that uh, uh, these kind of uh, policies, what we see in Hungary today, or what we see in Poland today, uh, more and more authoritarian, anti-democratic, or as they call themselves, e-liberal uh, democracies were given a huge boost uh, by um, uh, the Trump administration uh, and by the rhetoric in the United States because that legitimized uh, relatively small countries that were are pursuing anti-democratic policies. There are all kinds of differences within Europe itself uh, I don't think that there's a great deal of danger in Western Europe for um, collapse of democracy, but I think there is an erosion of democracy. In Eastern Europe, it's very different because there's a very short period of time that they have had democracy. Uh, and they lived first under communist rule before World, World War II. They lived under authoritarian rules, various dictators. Uh, and they also feel highly threatened. And I would say that the last thing I'd say to be quick is that what we see now, uh, that is the rise of Russia and the threat being posed by Russia to Ukraine and, and, and Eastern Europe is actually um, dangerous in the sense that it strengthens those uh, anti-democratic, more authoritarian, more populist regimes in Eastern Europe. Uh, and the only way to, as I see it, the only way to stop this erosion is to stand up to Russia because that's exactly what Russia is looking for. So Eastern Europe is now a very, very dangerous area for democracy as well as for security in the rest of Europe. Uh, somewhat along those lines, um, uh, it, if we have, and unfortunately we have an increasing, they already have had them for a long time in Europe, increasingly elected officials who are using this kind of imagery. Um, 
how can we combat that? What should should we, for example, um, call them simply call them anti semites, uh, or will or should or should we worry about that back backfiring? Well, I mean, the, the best way to deal with um, uh, politicians you don't like is to vote them out. And in order to vote them out, you need to organize and actually, you know, create the, the political forces in a democracy that will remove them. But while they're in power, yes, of course they should be outed. Of course, there's, there's no question about it. I, I, for a long time, have thought that it's changed. American political discourse was always very polite. Now it's, it's not at all polite. But I think that uh, the, the sort of democratic part, the, the small d uh, Democrats are still very, very shy about calling people out. I think they should be. Uh, many of the people who use this rhetoric, I, I believe uh, are using it only because they think it serves their purposes. I think they would use exactly the opposite rhetoric if it, they thought that would use it would be to their purpose. So outing them and weakening them may actually make them change the rhetoric they use because I think many of them don't actually have opinions. They, they just want to be in power. Thank you. Um, I want to thank you. Uh, this has been stimulating. These are difficult matters. Uh, we, as much as we at the museum and you, you and I as ed educators work on this, these things don't get any easier. Uh, I, you've dealt with them with uh, admirable and really re remarkable clarity and information, and uh, we very much appreciate you sharing that with us. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to turn this, turn it back to the museum, who I think have a few messages. Is that correct? There, there they are. There I am. I, no, I just um, want to thank you both. Thank you so much, Omer, for zooming in from Brown, um, taking time to do this. Thank you, Steve. I can't say you've cheered us up at all. Um, Omer, I don't know whether you have any last thoughts you want to leave us with or just leave it there. Any last comments you want to, you know, any, I, ho I, any hope you can yeah. offer us? Maybe that's the question. Leave well, us on a positive note. I'll try. I want to say something uh, very brief, you know, because I, I worked for many years on, on one little town in Eastern Europe that had a population of Jews, Poles, and Ukrainians who lived together for 400 years. And then they, they, they killed each other. Um, and uh, there was genocide in that place. Um, so that's not the, the positive story I want to tell. But I think that if we think if we remember that what caused that was a particular kind of both rhetoric of antagonizing one group against the other and external forces that moved in and triggered that. If we remember that and we think, how do we deal with our own societies? We have to, first of all, know how to speak with our neighbors. We have to know how fragile our own communities are and to strengthen them. And if we do that, and if we stand in the breach, it'll be much more difficult to undermine them. Thank you. No, that's great. I do want to just um, say a, a, another um, debt of gratitude to the Ostroff family and to Ella Ostroff for making this program possible. Very grateful. We do look forward to what we're able to do next year. We'll sign off now. Thank you both. Thank you so much. You've given us a lot to think about. And, um, Hope thank springs making, the turn. Yeah. Hope thank you for making it possible. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you bye bye, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. bye, -bye.